Welcome to the Accountants Exposed podcast, where we create light bulb moments for our listeners by exposing the journeys, secrets, and insights of some of the top players in accounting. This podcast is brought to you by Michael Edelstein, Director and Founder of Recruitment Expert, a specialist accounting recruitment agency working across Australia, New Zealand, and Asia Pacific. Ladies, gentlemen, and accountants, today we have John Waterworth on our podcast from Valenta AI. I met John at the Accounting and Business Expo earlier this year, and his talk really fascinated me because it was the first time I came across the acronym RPA. So I immediately had to know more. Turns out it stands for Robotic Process Automation. And after speaking with him, you'll realize it's not run-of-the-mill AI or the latest automation thing from zero. It's next level. It's pretty much like having a robot sitting next to your accountants, doing all the menial work your accountants don't want to do. But the robot is happy to do it 24-7. And it's inside your computer. So you don't even need to get him a desk. Basically, it's like a remote worker that never complains. Fascinating stuff. Definitely listen to this. Hi, John. Thank you for making the time to join me on the podcast today. Hey, Michael. Yeah, great to be here and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Pleasure. I came across you at the Accounting and Business Expo, I think, end of April, and you were on a panel there. Is that right? Yeah, it wasn't actually a panel. It was what they called a fireside Fireside, chat with with Kylie Baxter, looking to find out all about robotic process automation. What was the title of your fireside chat? Because it was an interesting one. Grab my attention. That's how... uh... Look, I think it was an introduction to robotic process automation, for accounting firms, I think. Okay. Um, that's what I normally, normally call I remember, it. Anyway. I remember it grabbed my attention because usually you see words like AI and big data and automation, but uh, the robotic part, I was like, wow, that's something new. Um, yeah, and I think certainly that, that robot imagery. Now, we often use uh, robot imagery when we're you know promoting this technology. It's not anything... People, accountants sometimes get a little bit disappointed that it's not a big silver robot. Yeah, I was like, do you bring a little and... silver robot with you to the meeting? No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll find out more about why it's called that uh, as we go through. Well, tell us a little bit about, I guess, your backstory. How did you get into robotics and specifically into the accounting industry? Uh, yeah, look, I my background is I've always worked in um, technology or technology sales primarily. Yeah. So um I started a, uh, a business back in 99, um, which without us even knowing it at the time, me and a, a couple of other guys um, launched a capability that was a software as a service before it, software was really a, a known term. In 99, software as a yeah. service, crazy. Yeah, because yeah. no one spoke about or talked about SaaS at all until maybe 2010. It was a huge thing. And then obviously a little bit before that. Yeah. Maybe a little bit before sort of yeah. Salesforce was coming in here at about uh, 2005 or something yeah, like that's, that. That's what I think. But it wasn't a, a huge thing where every accounting firm was going on to the cloud, etc. until, you know, two, Much later. 2010, yeah, plus minus yeah. a few years. Yeah, exactly. So that, that was just a small business that was um, based around fax technology initially, and then it expanded to email and SMS. But mm. essentially, instead of buying infrastructure, we built software programs that routed work through to our servers and we'd charge a click charge for, for delivery. So it was, uh, yeah, it was an interesting business. I sold my stake in that. I worked, started a software division at Fuji Xerox Australia. Um, so a photocopier company, but yeah. um, my division was looking at different um, software applications that could automate business processes that we sold solutions to all sorts of different businesses. So it might be an online mortgage processing application mm-hmm. for a big bank to a you know, an attendance application for a private school. So really quite varied. From there, I went to MYOB. So I managed the large practice division at MYOB for about uh, just a little under three years. And with their fairly recent acquisition um, by KKR, I left and um, looked at a... I did something with cybersecurity for a, a short time, but then I came across Valenta. Um, they had a an interesting capability around robotic process automation. And I'd seen the very start of that during my time at um, MYOB and the technology had come on a long way. Mm. And then understanding a little bit more about that and matching it to some of the challenges that I'd seen in the accounting industry, it just seemed uh, 
you know, a marriage made in heaven. And, and that's how I got involved in RPA. What are some of the challenges that you noticed? Well, I guess accounting firms as a, a vertical industry, quite interesting when you, you look at the way that they operate. So in terms of the cost base of most accounting firms, so as a percent staff, as a percentage of total cost Mm -hmm. is very high. Um, I remember this, this data might be a little bit old, but traditionally it was around 60 to 80% of total cost. Mm -hmm. So not as a percentage of revenue. I think those figures run more around the 30 to 40%, but very, very heavily people dependent. And then when you look at what those people do, there's, um, and I don't know the answer to this question. I'd, I'd love to actually get statistics or data to support this view, but um, there's an awful lot of an accountant's time that is spent in front of a computer driving data through an ever graying row of applications to complete <laughs> their process. So it's quite an, an interesting area because I, I certainly used to hear a lot about my more and more accounting firms wanting to focus and concentrate on advisory. So that that sort of spending time with clients, yeah. really doing the added value stuff. They all talk about it, yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> Hardly any of them do it, but yeah. And, and, and monetizing it is, is another challenge. But one of the biggest hurdles, I guess, is just freeing up from being chained to the computer, doing those repetitive tasks. Mm-hmm. I mean, that it's, a, it's almost a... Uh, an industry that's ideal for robotic process automation because there are so many um, repetitive computer-based tasks that go go in there. So, you know, I could certainly see um, some challenges in that industry. And and now, as was the case when I first joined Myob, there's increasingly a, ch- a challenge in attracting people to the industry. Mm, huge. So I think, yeah, in part, that may be related attracting to... Attracting and keeping them, yeah. Yeah, that repetitive nature of a lot of those tasks that people are going to be involved with. So, yeah, um, yeah they're, they're probably the, the the key factors where I thought there's there's a real real potential fit here. Yeah, okay, makes sense. And uh, I think we we talked about it before. There's a lot of buzzwords in the industry like AI and big data and automation. And uh, as I mentioned before, what grabbed my attention was a new buzzword which I haven't really come across, which is RPA. I'm like, what the hell is RPA? Um, can you, I guess, shine some light on what RPA is and how it's different to AI and automation? Because I think yeah. for a lot of people, it's probably, you know, they, they just assume when you talk about automation robotics, it's just AI. You know, they've, they've seen it, they've heard it, whatever. Look, but they're absolutely. actually quite yeah. different, aren't they? Yeah, look, when I was at the, the show the other day where, where we met, um, you walk around the hall there and there are so many similar sounding technologies and all of them claim to automate and, and quite rightly so they i'm sure they do all automate what were otherwise manual processes but there's a lot of similar sounding buzzwords and when i speak to accounting firms it's very rare that anyone really understands what robotic process automation is mm. they may have heard of it they may have even seen some little clip of something but you're right it's a very confused terminology landscape so look my definition of things um when I started working at Fuji Xerox, um, the big buzzword at the time was digital transformation. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we've been hearing that for quite a few years. Um, but to me, it's very much an umbrella term, really digital transformation. You're applying some sort of software technology to what was previously a manual process and you, you automate things. But it's yep. a pretty, pretty broad category. Um, I think every piece of software looks to automate Um, that's the value in it. That's why people buy the technology. And if you look at the big players in this industry, um, that's certainly what they do. The the Myobs, uh, the APSs, the Zeros, they're constantly acquiring smaller software companies, trying to integrate that technology into their Mm -hmm. platform to improve automation um, because that's where they're going to win customers. Um, But it's quite a slow process. Yeah. So, Robotic process automation is is quite different. It is a piece of software, and it doesn't it replace doesn't... any software as well. Is no, it? yeah, no. It's it's very different in that regard. So it's it is a piece of software, but it doesn't act like any other piece of software. It's you don't have a screen or something that people interact with. Instead, what it does, to put it really simply, is it mimics the way a human interacts with a keyboard. Mm. So it has the ability to move a uh, move the mouse 
move the cursor around the screen, click on things, and then use any of the functions of your keyboard. It'd be so much so, more fun if there was an actual silver robot sitting at a desk next to a human. Yeah. <laughs> that like the, and it'd be like the meme, the future of accounting firms. Well, well, maybe we can just maybe we should consider supplying a battery operated one that does all that while the software robot does well, the actual the future work. accounting firms I, I can already envision it there'll be a partner that walks in in the morning at 9 a.m he turns on the electricity powerpoints the robots power on then um they're working and then there's an offshore team in philippines or india backing them up and then there's just a partner you know having a chat to clients during well, the day. i don't think that we'll ever quite get there but <laughs> but yeah you're right it's, it's very different so uh RPA, look, it, it, it often helps. What I found helped me to understand really what it was is to understand where it came from. So the big enterprise software vendors, so the, you know, the SAPs, the Microsofts, before they launch an application on market, they've got to thoroughly stress test it, load test it, understand mm -hmm. what happens if buttons are pressed in a certain sequence. So they used to employ lots of people to do that work. And then they developed software applications that would mimic the way that the human moves the cursor around and clicks on things. And then where it really changed is a couple of vendors added to that basic capability. They added a logic set so you could um, very tightly determine what the robot does. Mm -hmm. And they um, developed an application development platform that made it really simple and quick to develop the robots or program the robots. So the way I describe it, whether it's technically correct or not, it's more of a, a drag and drop development environment. Mm -hmm. So rather than using traditional code, you've got highly skilled programmers can, that can use this very quick to build interface. Yeah. So what that means is we can typically sit down with a, a firm, understand the process they would like to automate. And once we've captured that understanding of how they do it currently, we can have a robot built to mimic that process within somewhere between two and eight weeks. Why does it take so long? What what is what takes so long? The two to eight weeks. Why like if it's a quick interface thing? Okay, well the two to eight weeks, if you look at uh, traditional software development, if you were to try to undertake that process in traditional programming languages, you could be looking at you'd be measuring it in years. True. Not, months and not years, weeks. Yeah. So that really is the difference. If you look at um most software applications to launch new capability um, the development timeline on that can be is usually measured in in years rather than weeks hmm. and so one of the key advantages of robotic process automation is that it fills all those gaps that exist in your software set so probably to explain that in a, in a better detail if you think about an accounting firm they'll have a, a layer of Know, physical infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, so yep. the computers, the laptops, servers, etc. You've got a myriad of software applications that sit on that that's seeming to grow at about 10% a year, <laughs> despite all the consolidation that you have with the big players mm. uh, in the space. And then you've got a whole bunch of people that sit in front of the computer screen and they move data through these applications to complete a process. So what robotic process automation is targeted at is not the software applications. All of that stays exactly as is, but it replaces the work that the humans have to do in pushing those repetitive transactional tasks through the system end to end. Yeah. Can you give us an example, like a, a specific process that, because you've got, you know, quite yeah. a few accounting firms that are using your uh, product. What, what are some of the typical processes they've automated? What does that look like? What is the time saving involved? Sure, sure. Look, there's there's quite a lot of uh, examples. We started with the very first one was a, a bookkeeping reconciliation type process. Mm -hmm. So it was a firm that you know already had Receipt Bank or Dext. Um, they used a mixture of Zero, Myob, QuickBooks, and they're going through the reconciliation process where the accountant or the bookkeeper has to reconcile, match the invoice to the, the bank entry, um, have that accepted in the client file and move on. Now, that was quite a challenging firm in that they had a different chart of accounts for every single client. Um, they were using you know three or four different software vendors. Mm -hmm. And so the robot had to be programmed to recognize which account used which chart of accounts, 
which uh, client used which software application. And it basically mimics the work that the human does uh, in that it takes the raw data from Receipt Bank. Mm -hmm. It logs into the zero file for the client with a username and a password, just like the human would. And it goes through that reconciliation process. At the end of that, it um, creates a spreadsheet of any exceptions. So we started at about um, an 80% straight through processing rate. That's built up as we've built new rules um, to handle the exceptions to a, about the mid 90s at the moment. Mm -hmm. And that was a, you know, a great example. So this was a firm that was using quite a number of offshore resources that have now those offshore resources now that this is established are being put to different work. We've got another great example, which I think uh, a lot of firms will see value in where, and this is where you'll tell I'm not an accountant. So I'll describe the process, <laughs> but it may not be in the right language. Um, so this, this was a, uh, a work paper completion process, mm -hmm. but one of the core aspects, which will be common to quite a few processes in accounting firms was the accountant had to log into the ATO, uh, using the, my gov ID, uh, check-in credentials. Yeah. For a simple firm, they generate four or five different reports. They'd have to download those reports from the ATO portal, rename the files differently to go into two different repositories eventually, redact the TFN number from certain files, then copy and paste critical data from certain points into the report into a work paper or directly into a return. Mm -hmm. So in terms of a, a business case, that process used to take the firm on average 45 minutes. So for a simple firm, it took about 15 minutes. For a complex group of companies, it could take up to three hours mm -hmm. and an average of about 45 minutes. The robot completes that job in eight minutes. And those people are now free to go and do whatever else will add value to the firm instead of that work. So and it's working in the background on their computer. Is that how it works? It's you install it on, on the, is it on, well, cause there's a lot of cloud systems yeah. and software. So I'm like, where does the robot sit? Is it in the, in the PC? Is it on the server? Is it look, essentially it does run on a PC and then it's a question of where. So by default, we host it on AWS Amazon mm -hmm. web services out of Brisbane and it accesses the client environment just like any other user in their environment would. So this is the, the bit that people um, also uh, struggle with a little bit. The robot is, is really could be thought of as a digital worker because yep. everything about it acts very similar to how a human does. So it accesses your environment by you issue it with a, a username, mm -hmm. an email address, um, your your IT department will give it access to whatever applications it needs <laughs> to complete its tasks. Yeah, gives them access to the login details, and away it goes. So it's simply when it wakes up in the morning, and it's triggered to do, say, the ATO download process that I mentioned. When who would trigger? How does the triggering process do? Do you time it? Like how do the accounting firms do it? Or does a staff member have to manually go in and go start process? There's a there's two different ways. You either have as you mentioned there, a staff member triggers the process. Mm -hmm. um, most firms, once they'll have two or three processes, will actually then start scheduling it mm -hmm. so that there's no conflict. So a robot's very similar to a human in that, or at least a male human in that it can only do <laughs> one thing at a time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you have to basically set it a time period. So typically what will happen is you'll schedule it to do, let's say, bookkeeping yep. from 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock. And then go on and reconcile a whole bunch of client accounts between e 9 and 11. Yep. Exactly. So and, then what, many, and then a human account. would normally take over after 11 to finish the, like, the exception list. and Yes, whatever else was required downstream yep. from that process. Okay. Um, from 11 o'clock, it might be on ATO downloads. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it'll switch into self-managed super fund administration. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of tasks, and you'll determine whether it makes sense to schedule those or whether you want triggers. Okay. So, um, yeah, really quite a, if you think of it as a digital worker that you set up tasks for. Yep. And look, probably what we have we should have mentioned earlier in the piece, which I guess is really the punchline of uh, a lot of what we're talking about is, is why would it, why would an accounting firm be interested in this? 
And it's really to do with the capacity and speed that the robot can work. So a uh, an RPA robot will typically perform a task somewhere between three and 20 times quicker than a, a really well-trained human could. Mm-hmm. So if you were to put them side by side, give them a whole bunch of jobs and press go, depending on task. Now, in, in some of the more complex accounting processes, we're probably seeing a rate that's realistically about six times quicker than a human. But then you add that to the fact that the robot doesn't slow down, mm. it doesn't take breaks or lunch, and it doesn't go home at five o'clock either. So it can continue processing tasks 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. And then it comes down to how you schedule it. And do most robots, like, sorry, do most accounting firms just have one robot working or do they eventually hire multiple robots? Look, for, for us, it'll, it's too early to, to say. Certainly, I think some of the bigger firms, multi-office locations will end up with several. Yeah. But a, a robot, and certainly the model that we've built for accounting firms, is a multi-process capable robot. So if you think of it, again, of being a little bit like a human or a male human that can mm. do one task at a time, you simply uh, build the first process, um, we charge our, our billing structure, and this is probably what's made us a little bit unique in the accounting space, is my belief is most accounting firms will end up with somewhere between 10 and maybe up to 30 different processes that they can use robot technology to complete. Up to 30. Wow. Yeah. Look, it's crazy. There's a interesting Despite email. all the automation that's already happened in the, in the accounting world. Absolutely, because, and, and this is again going back to that uh, thinking about it's not replacing your software, it's replacing the people interaction with that software. How do you compare to like, cause, uh, for, for example, I know a lot of companies use like Zapier where it, it taught, you know, there's a trigger which is something enters into this thing and then it, it gets, either file gets sent, an email gets triggered, whatever. Yep by a different system, so it interconnects different systems to, to do something a human would normally have done manually. Absolutely. And that's a, you know, a great example of a software application that does this kind of work. I guess the difference with a software robot is the fact that it is custom built yeah. for each particular process. So with any piece of software, there's usually um, a decision that needs to be made like mm. does this replace another piece of software in my environment um, i've got to retrain the staff to do this particular piece of uh, work with this particular particular piece of software yeah. and the software is sort of pretty much set in stone it does what it does and you make your decision on that basis with a software robot you program it um, initially and also continually so what you're essentially buying is an amount of processing capacity and you can very easily reprogram it to change exactly what it's doing. So I would always recommend that if there's a piece of software that does the task that you're doing, great, get, get the piece of software. Um, because all the vendors in the accounting space, they're all driving towards having the platform that automates that um, the process in your environment the best to yeah. win more customers. And eventually what you have today, your robot performing, the, the software providers may well bring that functionality into their application. Hmm. You then simply divert that capacity you have in the robot to perform some other task. Okay. Does that make sense? So it's who is responsible for reprogramming? Would it be one of your staff that has to be trained in the platform or do we have to go back to Valenta and... So yeah, Valenta provide a, a managed service. So for a um, 24 hours a day, multi-process capable robot, we charge $4,000 a month. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and that includes this, all the reprogramming as well? Ab- absolutely. So okay. this is the other side of that, that equation that we started before. If you think about, okay, a robot might perform a process, say, five or six times quicker than a human, yep. 24 hours a day rather than eight seven to eight days a week rather than five, um, you could very conservatively say that you'll probably get about 20 times the output that you would from a human from a robot. Hmm. And at $4,000 a month, you're talking about 
you know, half or a third of a junior resource onshore yep. and not far uh, off the cost of uh, an offshore resource, mm. but around 20 times the output. So that's the so value proposition, basically. Yeah, and it's, it's certainly going to have a, a phenomenal difference in the accounting space. I was going to say accountants love numbers, so the way you've quantified it, you know, 20 times the output and the cost of an offshore resource. It's a good, tag, it's a good tagline. And look, to be honest, a lot of firms initially feel that that's sort of too, be, too good to be true. And, and I understand that sort of skepticism. But maybe to help your listeners understand, it's, this is not a new thing in the accounting industry. Hmm. If you look at the big four in, in your space, they've been using software robots. They've really been the, the organizations that have pioneered it. So they, they've been using robots extensively for about three or four years now. They've also taken the concept to the big banks and the insurance companies and made millions out of deploying those projects. The industry, it's, the RPA industry itself, um, is one of the fastest growing sectors in the software market. So UiPath is, last year I think, was the soft, fastest growing software company in the world. But it's primarily been focused at the big end of town. So banks, insurance companies mm. that have lots and lots of hugely high volume transactions. Yep. But the, the big fours experience, there's a, there was a great study I came across um, by Virginia University mm -hmm. published on the Social Sciences Research Network. And even just the abstract alone tells the story brilliantly. So the big four have used RPA extensively in all the main functional areas of the firm. So it's not just tax and compliance. It's in audit, even consulting. The... Average reduction in end-to-end -end pr processing time for the processes which they've applied it is the average reduction is 80%. Wow. So a phenomenal impact. Yeah. And I guess you know, that's across hundreds of different processes in that environment. Can I so, ask you a quick question? Um, yeah, yeah. Say there was a – imagine the, the, the beginning part is probably the most complicated where – you know, someone has to go into the practice, sit there, monitor, and you know, probably document the process. Then your your back office team will probably program the robot. Um, once that's done and the robot is operating, because there's constant updates to software and ATO yep. portals, etc. If something changes, like a button moves from one place to another place, a screen changes, there's an extra screen involved, whatever, or there's one less screen because someone has you know zero has decided to automate something. How will the robot handle that change? Or does it have to be reprogrammed from scratch? Or how yeah, does it work? It's, it, it's a great question. And, and the answer to that is yes, it does. Um, so the robot is, there's two sort of exceptions you get. One is um, there's a data integrity issue. Mm. So in other words, it's expecting numbers in a field and it's got letters or it's expecting numbers yep. in a particular sequence and it's not there. And that creates an exception that would go back to the, the firm so that they're aware, okay, we need to clean this bit up. The other exception is what we call a, a system or an environment exception, which is something has just changed. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, uh, those updates that you mentioned, so Zero or Myob have done a, an update, quarterly update overnight, and suddenly the invoice number that used to be in the top right-hand corner has moved down to the bottom left. Yep. Now, your people, when they log in, will instantly recognize that, or I hope they would, <laughs> whereas the robot won't. It'll mm. just know it's not there. It'll throw an exception that would go to both us and to the, the client. Yep. Now, from our end, that sort of thing is really simple. It's just a case of, okay, human gets the exception. We log into the system, and we see, just like the um, accountant would, that it's moved from the top right to the bottom left. Mm -hmm. And we change the code accordingly which is you know a matter of minutes sort of work okay so it's um, not another two to eight weeks to wait for no oh, okay now we we build the entire program in two to eight weeks so yep. making these minor little changes is is literally a drag and drop exercise in the code yep. and most of these we've uh, seen and resolved before any before to be honest it's finished its run and so often by its second run on that list yep. it'll process it correctly because we've made the adjustments without even having to be called by the accountant to go hey john this exactly. thing isn't way okay yeah exactly so we're continually monitoring those and they look they don't happen all the time but they certainly do happen hmm. the other thing is that 
you know, firms will want to change their process anyway. Mm. You know, processes do change. Yep. And so as part of that... Uh, or new software that they have decided to integrate into the workflow, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And if it's obviously still the same process, we don't charge anything extra for those. If it's a, a significant change, like equivalent to being a new process, then we would charge uh, that uh, reprocessing fee again on top of that. So, and what does that reprocessing again, fee look like? Yeah, the process bill costs are, we've, I recognize for accounting firms that they're going to have a high number of processes that they're going to eventually be able to use this for. So we've kept really the processing build costs as a non-profit making area of the operation. Yep. So we charge 3250 to mm -hmm. build a new process. Yep. And you can keep adding those processes to your single robot until you start getting capacity constraints, yep. at which point it might be worth looking at process robot two or robot three. And you're saying you usually can build up to 20, 30 process before you get those constraints or? Well, it all depends on the volume of what you're doing. Yeah. So we've got a, um, at the moment, the record is a, a private school in Sydney yep. that have got over 40 processes running on a single robot. Wow. Um, and a lot of those are silly little things, you know, they're very, very minor that take the, the robot minutes to uh, complete. But if you think in an accounting firm, they could get to the point where you had a very, you know, if you had a large practice with very high volume, you might run only two or three processes on a single robot before you hit that capacity constraint. Yeah. But if you ever get to that point, remembering the metrics we talked about before, so roughly 20 times the output mm. that you would get from a human at a third of a cost of a human, well, you're doing very, very well if you've ever managed to get that or, or needed to get that second robot into yeah. the business. What's a typical size of firm that would, or the minimum size of the practice, in either in terms of volume or staff that would benefit and there's a strong ROI there? Or an ROI that at least warrants, you know. Yeah, absolutely. To... Look, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. It's one I'm trying to find the answer to at the moment <laughs> um, because we, we've got a bit of flexi flexibility in our model. And what my objective is when I sit down with a firm is we normally uh, look at one at most two processes to start off with. Mm. Uh, and the reason being is in our engagement model, we carry all the risk. So in other words, we'll document your process, we'll um, build, develop it, We'll test it in your environment on 10 to 15 clients until you're satisfied with the way it works. Yep. And not until you ask us to put it live in your environment do we charge you anything. Mm. And then that's the process build and so on. So and that's the two, do, two to eight weeks part. Yes, exactly. And so we, we do limit it to one or two processes to begin with. Yep. But what I'm also aiming to do is make that from day one at least cost neutral for the business. Mm. So in other words, the two processes, the one or two processes that we build for you initially will more than pay for the robot so that as you add your third, your fourth, your fifth, your sixth process, it's no increased charge from us other than the one-off process built and you're getting increased benefit all the way through. Okay. So um, yeah, from that, from that perspective, it's, um, it's really powerful. Look, I've, been involved in digital transformation technologies for ages and what was generally considered a a good value proposition was if the client had a return on investment in 18 months to 24 months mm. so in other words whatever it would cost you it'll take you two years to claw that claw back yeah what we're talking about here if you're picking the right process from day one is an instant return um so in other words, as soon as you deploy it. A return or cost neutral though? Say again? Uh, like an ROI or a, a cost neutral kind of? It, it, I would always say, because because you can keep adding processes to the robot, yeah. then aim at something that's cost neutral. But many of our clients, because of the processes they've chosen. Um, I mean, it depends on how you define cost neutral. Well cost ahead. neutral essentially is kind of like payback period, you know, 100% ROI return in a way. So it depends on how you look at it, I guess, from an accounting yeah. perspective. Yeah. So look, I guess, uh, put it put it this way, if we, even some of the processes that I described before, so the ATO download process, that was taking the firm 
45 minutes on average yep. over, I think it was just under 3,000 entities that they were um, had that process run on. So 3,000 entities times 45 minutes mm. is about a year and two-thirds of a person's time. Mm. At least, So, yeah. And the other great thing about re- uh, robot deployment, it's not like any other software deployment. Most software deployments are quite a big change management. You've got to change processes to accommodate how the software works. Yeah. You've also got to retrain and educate your people on how to use the new software. With a robot deployment, it's very different. It's as simple as, hey, guys, you no longer need to do this piece of work. Yeah. And so with that kind of deployment, um, we were, instead of charging you know, a year and a half's worth of an onshore person's salary, we're charging a third of an onshore person's salary. And so that was you know, way better than cost neutral from day one. Mm. And still using less than 10% of the robot's capacity. Yeah. So it's still got 90% of its capacity to keep adding more and more processes and increasing value. So what, the what's the typical size of, in terms of either revenue or number of staff of your clients? Look, um, it probably, I don't know the answers to all exactly what the revenue is, but I've targeted probably the mid to larger end of the market. Mm-hmm. So our smallest at the moment is probably a three or four partner firm okay. with about 15 to 20 staff. So certainly by no means huge. Yep. Um, and the bigger end are a couple of firms that are in the top 10 firms in Australia. Okay. And, what, uh, so that, and everything in between. If we look at the three to four partner firm, which is probably, I guess, typical of the accounting industry or 15, 20 staff, um, what sort of feedback are you getting and what sort of ROI are they getting you could well funny that particular firm was a little bit of an odd one um in as much as whilst i've said i always try to encourage them to aim at a process that's going to be cost neutral uh, to begin with they actually chose a process that, that to me didn't really make sense it was their ias process mm-hmm. um so the installment activity statements yeah. and um with that particular firm they were only processing a few hundred of these um a month yeah, and I'm not sure exactly how long it was taking, but it certainly didn't wouldn't be a four thousand uh, dollar a month problem for them. But their logic was, well, this particular process for us carries a lot of risk. It's something that the staff um, tend to avoid or <laughs> leave to late in the month. Yeah, uh, and we've run into quite a few instances in recent times where we've um, not had submissions in on time. Clients have been fined. So different logic, but it makes sense, yeah. Yeah, they've, they've basically got reputational risk there. But the interesting thing about that firm is they've gone through the experience with the IAS process, and they've now got a list of 20 other processes that they want us to consider. Because it's been a proven and tested thing. Yeah, exactly. Or they've just understood. I think once you start, um, you get that initial process done, you understand how we deliver. Yeah. And also you understand how broad the application is Mm. um and yeah so that was quite an interesting one but other firms just to go back to one of your questions before about how small do you need to be yeah it's um it's something that i'm trying to test the waters with a little bit at the moment so there must be um, a number of transactions or number of clients that's kind of like the minimum threshold where you get significant value across neutrality right it, it's all related to volume, I guess, yeah. in a way. So, so how many, that's how the many... benefit, right? How quickly can you go through the volume? Yeah, Exactly. Yeah, so you, the volume does need to be there. So I know from experience already that um, you know one or two processes for a medium uh, to large firm more than pays for the robot from, from day one. Yeah. Um, with smaller firms, I think we might need a potentially a different model so there's an idea that um i'm in discussion with a couple of firms with at the moment about a shared robot Mm. scenario so essentially what this would be is we would charge maybe two thousand dollars a month but you have access to the robot for three or four hours in the day and we would basically sell that across three companies we couldn't do more than three because you need development time on the on the robot as well yeah but that would mean, okay, it's half the usual cost. And we might allow three or four processes 
for that smaller firm to get to the point that it's cost yeah. neutral because because many yeah, firms well, would be doing very similar processes absolutely yeah, and look, and what i've found really encouraging is a lot a lot of them are doing different processes so my expectation when we started is that they would probably all want to do the bookkeeping um mm scenario that i mentioned first but to be honest whilst that's on a list for most of the others at some point no one else has chosen that as their first process they've all done different things which was really encouraging for me because it makes you realize that yes there really is going to be this number of applications in an accounting environment yeah and hence the confidence that most of them are going to end up with somewhere between 10 and 20 processes mm. that can be performed by the robot. And is there a minimum time that you have to commit to the robot like is it, or, or with Valenta? Look, we're, we're in the early days. Like, So I joined Valenta in uh, June last year. So I would still say we're in the early adopters phase. Yeah. So we signed our first client in November in the accounting space. And we've signed up another 11 or 12 since then and i've got quite a quite a few that uh i think will be on board as soon as i get back from holiday in uh arriving back in mid-july um and so at, at at the moment that there's no um minimums as such so it's it's a case of we're building a model that we think makes sense for this yes. uh for this industry and I think as we move to the smaller firms, we'll 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 tweak that slightly. Okay. Who owns the process? I'm curious. Like for example, if you developed a robot for one firm, could you not just resell the robot at a much cheaper cost? If and then uh, just tell the client, look, you you know we can redevelop everything from scratch for you know this much money, or hey, this is a very optimal, you know, from what I know in the industry, this is the most optimal, fastest process and I can sell it to in a ready-made robot for this price. Wouldn't Look, that be an option? There is, a, there is a speed, but you've got to, the build cost is negligible anyway. So if you think about the process build cost, it's a one-off process build for $3,250. Yeah. So that's not really the... Uh, the thing that accountants have a uh, would have any questions around most partners of RPA vendors would charge somewhere between like probably the cheapest I've seen is around thirty thousand dollars up to eighty thousand dollars to build a process. Wow, really? Yeah, and most of those firms are very much um, targeting the the big end of town, so they're aiming at large enterprise. Yep, and that's really the the difference in the Valenta model. It's the recognition that accounting firms are going to need to get proper value out of it. They're going to need multiple processes. We we started life as an offshore business and still have a significant offshoring business. So all our development is done from India, where we've got great access to really good, capable people. Mm -hmm. And that's allowed us to build this commercial model where we only charge $3,250 to build a process. Now, we lose uh, to be frank, on some of that, um, some we might gain if it's a very simple, quick build process. Yeah, but it's very competitive. Um, Do you have any so, competition, like in the accounting industry? Look, like who would you consider your competitors at all? Well, to be honest, there's only in my dialogue with accounting firms, and I started really um, just outside the top four, um, or the big four, or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. um, and I've only come across two firms that were either one in the process of deploying RPA and one who had already implemented RPA. And they were big firms and they had done it on the, under the traditional partner model where mm -hmm. they've spent quite a lot of money on consulting up front. Um, they've spent a lot of money to build the process and they've got one process live. <laughs> Our model is quite different. Um, as I said, like I've tried to build this, having got a little bit of experience of accountants during my time at Myob, they're um, uh, risk averse, perhaps. Mm. Um, the partnership structure means that there's the decision making process can be quite arduous. You've got to get multiple people on board. Yep. And certainly with a new sounding technology like, um, you know, AI, RPA, those things we talked about before, um, I wanted to make it as simple as possible. 
So really with our model, I think we are unique in that we've removed all that risk from the upfront process. Yep. And we've built a model that's built for small to medium size enterprise. Is there an issue that you've come a backlash from the industry of, in general with the whole, you know, infiltration of robotics and AI, et cetera, where that means, you know, there won't be a need for say junior accountants or down the track when you built enough processes, you know, well, together no. offshore, like you probably don't even need local staff. You look, t to be honest, I think it's almost the, the opposite. Uh, I think it's been very welcomed in the same way that um, offshoring uh, a number of years ago was a uh, something that was you know maybe considered questionable now nearly every firm has is deploying mm. um offshore uh, people and robotics gives you a capability to bring some of that work and data back onshore the other thing is most firms are struggling to attract people into the profession um and part of that at least has got to be because of that high volume robotic nature of some of the work. Mm. So really what we would we're seeing is excitement from from firms about the possibility that they can redeploy people into more value creating and more interesting roles. And do you see that happening though? Look like are they, are they actually doing it? To be blunt about it, we're too young in this to to really know. You know, okay. as I said, we're less than a, a year in. Um so it'll take, I was, cause I was going to say, but there is data, you know, um, I referenced that report from Virginia um, University. Yeah. So one of the other benefits that they found is that despite this massive deployment of RPA, they haven't seen a decrease in onshore headcount. Hmm. So the, um, the number of people is still the same. They're able to service far more work than they could do previously. It has impacted offshore headcount though. So they've definitely seen a significant increase in offshoring in those firms as a result. And it's probably not surprising because if you think of the, at the end of the day, a robot can't do everything. Um, and there's lots of tasks in an accounting environment that you need a person's eye and their intelligence um, to, to, to complete. A lot of the work that is offshored tends to be the more transactional, robotic, high volume stuff. So consequently, yeah. Having that being able to be produced at a better and lower cost on shore has been welcomed. So you're saying, so just to clarify, did you say there yep. has been an increase in offshore headcount or a decrease in offshore headcount? A decrease. A decrease, okay. A decrease. That's yeah, what I thought. The, okay. In the big four, you, yeah, maybe I got my term. Yeah. Mixed up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that makes more sense. Um, interesting. It's just uh, the reason I brought it up is in accounting firms, there are people that are naturally good at advisory and client relationships but i think there is a, a significant chunk of the staffing population um in the industry that is kind of just very well ad well very adapted just doing the the mechanical process yep. stuff um and that's what they're good at and that's what they do and you know some of them don't even want to talk to clients um or you know forget forget about advisory just don't even want to deal with clients but they're good at the compliance aspects so i'm curious that big chunk of that industry that, you know, you'd struggle to convert them into good relationship or advisory kind of people, whether they, you know, in five or 10 years time would be kind of driven out of the industry essentially by Look, RPA. It's, it's gonna, it, I would imagine it's going to have an impact. It's mm. going to have an impact on the type of work that people do. Um, you now I've read various articles on uh, RPA and one of the often stated terms is that RPA is coming after tasks mm. rather than jobs, but the jobs that the people do will change. And that's the thing, like the, the, the common advice is, look, the reality is there will be AI, there is offshoring, there is RPA, like you need to upskill to ensure that you're maintaining your value in the market if you want to have, you know, if you want to make a living, because no, one, no one's going to pay you for something that someone else can do for cheaper or, you know, automated. And I think that is just a, a reality, um, but it's a scary you know, reality it, for some, I guess. Yeah, it, it 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 may be, it may be, but I think you've also got to look at that in the context of automation of all sorts of things. Mm. Um, and we we actually have a you know an employment rate 
that is lower than it on an unemployment rate that's lower than it ever has been. Yeah. So despite all of this automation, despite certain elements of people's jobs changing and being taken over by technology, which has happened in the accounting industry for as, yeah. as long as we can remember, people are still employed and we're still uh, in the position, particularly in Australia, where accounting firms are really struggling with the people side of things. 100%. They're struggling to retain, they're struggling to attract new people into the profession. Well, that's why they're having to resort to more automation and IPA and offshoring, et cetera, is because they can't A, attract, but B, retain staff. Yeah, exactly. And I, I certainly think having seen some of the processes that the robots are now performing, I can fully understand why the firm and the people wanted to get a robot to do it because, <laughs> you know, it's there's only so many times you want to be logging onto the ATO portal and generating a report a day. Makes sense. Um, do you see any other big trends in the accounting industry or any other, I don't know, the, what, what's the next big innovation? Or, or is, RPA, is RPA the next big thing? Look, it's, fu it's funny because especially when you talk about that confusion with, with AI, with this term robotic process automation because we do some work with ai as well mm. under a similar model um, it's not our platform but we bring a commercial model that's delivered from offshore that makes it a viable um, capability for small to medium sized uh, firms yeah a couple of firms in talking about processes that we could complete there's been elements of ai we've not delivered any of these yet because i still think it's a little bit of a step too far mm. but um we had a firm that was looking, they had a very high volume of uh, individual tax returns and they, they saw it as a bit of a thorn in the side. It was something they were all, almost obligated to do for business clients, but yep. there was very little money in it and so on and so forth. So we looked at how we could apply uh, ro robot technology or RPA and came up with a pretty smart solution. So this was um, the robot would download the data from the ATO it would then go and check against the previous two years returns to look for additional information like do they have um, investment properties yep. do they have other investments and so on and so forth from that they could then generate a communication to the client to ask for these additional supporting documents and that's where we stopped but there was discussion about wow if the robot can generate the email with this list of content, could it book in the meeting for us? <laughs> and we've got <laughs> AI capable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, we've got AI capable robots that can um, understand that human like interaction so that it could actually trigger a, an outbound call saying, hi, this is XYZ accounting firm. When would you like to book in your meeting with your accountant? The, the the person can respond with just normal language. Well, how about next Wednesday? The robot goes away and books in the time in both calendars. And so, I don't know. I think it's a step too far. Mm. I think let's get some of the simple robotic stuff in <laughs> place first, and then we can think about AI. Because I think for a lot of people, it's probably just a little bit too too soon yet. But undoubtedly, it will happen. Yeah, I, yeah. Mean, I remember seven years ago, I was reading about even earlier. Um, IBM Watson and yes. the application of that, like for like hotels in Japan, were basically fully automated. the The reception was run by robots. the The person showing you to a room was run by ro robots. Um, you know, and I remember in UK even there was one or two councils that automated their service people to be, you know, based on IBM Watson to be able to take phone calls and address, you know the most typical queries and anything more complicated outside the typical 80 to 90% would be taken by, by a human. So no, and this was seven plus years ago. So yeah, look, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And that technology has come on leaps and bounds since then. Mm. Like I remember being involved in a project for fair work, Australia, fair work, Australia, um, where we were using AI natural language understanding technologies. And this was a, significant call center in Canberra. And if you imagine the kind of calls that come into that environment, mm. it could be, you know, it could be a, a white collar worker working at a legal firm who's for whatever reason been let go of his company. So they get on the phone and describe that in one way. And then the, the next call is from a brickie 
who's also been laid off from yeah. the, the work site, and he would be describing it very differently indeed. <laughs> and the technology had the ability to distinguish and learn from these interactions that it essentially means the same thing yeah. and how to respond to that and where to divert them. And so, yeah, AI is um, in, in a call center environment is a huge thing now, and the capabilities are, are very much there. I think it's you know probably a, a little bit soon for it to be automatically accepted in the you know very broad arena in which accountants would have yeah. an influence. No, I agree. But yeah, at some point, who knows? And that's the interesting thing, you know, that a lot of if you Google or you start researching AI and robots and things like that in the accounting press, it's nearly always positioned as futuristic, and mm. I think that's correct from an AI context that you know it's an emerging technology but certainly robotic process automation this is pretty established now it's been around in large enterprise for four or five years yeah. and at scale as well it's not just been a small thing it's at huge scale um, really the question is why it hasn't penetrated into the mainstream accounting market because it's almost the perfect industry for it yeah and I think it you know boils largely down to that getting the model right and one that works no appreciate that john it's been uh very insightful um a couple of rapid fire questions what's your favorite quote ah yes you did warn me that you were going to say this and um i forgot almost straight away <laughs> there's actually a couple of things on the wall here um one was a quote um that's uh man uh, can be destroyed but never defeated or well, man was not made to feet, which was an Ernest Hemingway quote that I've had on my wall, A, because I like the book, which is probably going to be the answer to your next question. <laughs> we'll go with but, that. What, uh, was, what was the book, your favorite book? It, it was The Old Man and the Sea. Yeah. Okay. The Old Man and the Sea, which is Ernest Hemingway, which does sort of put that quote in context a little bit because at the end of the day, he was just catching a big fish. Yeah. But certainly one that could have application in other environments. <laughs> um. What have you read, watched, or learned recently that's had, you know, an impact on you or made you think and go, wow? Yeah, look, I, I think um, probably the sort of stuff that I've been reading of late has been more around, you know, philosophies of approach um, to business. Mm -hmm. And it's, I've started a relatively new venture here. And it's probably looking at, um, so there's not, there's not particular titles. It's just elements that I've picked up from a number of areas about planning for what you actually want to get out of the organization that you're, you're trying to create yep. um, and what is the value that you're looking to deliver. And one of the things that has made me very excited about this is the fact that I think this has the potential to have a, a huge impact in a very short space of time yep. for firms and make a real difference as opposed to I have been involved in environments where it's felt like you're you're bringing to market a very similar capability to what's already available and yep. trying to differentiate on the small stuff. Yeah, okay. Makes sense. And last question, who would you want to have a drink with the most in the world, past or present? Yeah, look, again, to be perfectly honest about this, because I know probably what I should be saying is some <laughs> inspirational figure from the past that has great meaning but but the in all honesty um when i thought about this question it would be almost anyone in history from my family i was just thinking how fantastic would it be to go for a drink with not just one let's get a few generations of past family members you know people that i've known if you think of grandparents yeah. um certain people that you've heard of in the in the past uh, about your family so i had a my dad did some research before I moved to Australia. I've been here 25 years. Um, before I came over, my dad was doing you know that research into family history that I was never interested in at the time. And he mentioned that we had a relative that was mayor of Sydney, and I've got a picture of him in a newspaper on the har on the Harbour Bridge, which I thought well, that's, that's not that old. Anyway, he he got me to go and do some research and um, went to town hall. And the guy told me there that, look, in those days, every little suburb had a mayor. Yeah. They were often called a mayor. But years later, I came across something, a place called Waterworth Park in uh, Canterbury. Mm -hmm. 
and um, looked further into it and saw that it was named after Alderman Waterworth and his, oh, what was his name? Some, um, Augustus or something like that, that a bizarre name, but one that definitely runs in our family. And I found that, um, yeah, it was the same guy. He was on the Harbour Bridge opening, <laughs> uh, dressed as Captain Cook. Waterworth Park was also named after a rubbish dump, a reclaimed rubbish dump. Yeah. So, you know, that family claim claim to fame is we were named after a rubbish dump. <laughs> <laughs> but it'd be great to get some of those people together. And what, what would you ask them? What would be your, your first question? Oh, I'd love to know what was their life like, what were their aspirations for mm. their kids and their family, and just, uh, yeah, let them know that it all worked out pretty well. <laughs> Good to know. John, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Good on you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for tuning in and hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like our podcast and share it on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, wherever it is you hang out so more people can benefit from these speakers. Also, please subscribe on our website so you get all of our latest episodes. And if there's anything else I can help you with or you have speakers you'd love to hear from, with some feedback about the current episode, please feel free to send an email to michael at recruitmentexpert.com.au. Until then, take care, and I look forward to connecting with you in the future.